saying that, but certainly a series of teachings uh, this month that we have tagged Love Struck. Love Struck. You know the thing about February, uh, if you can't remember anything about February, at least you remember 15th and you know that it's about love and well. Did I say 15th? <laughs> Forgive. Yeah. Thank God I'm pre preaching about forgiveness this morning. So, yeah. 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 It's 14th, 14th, 14th. You know, some people who are expecting something on 14th, they can't forget the date. Yeah. So most people who corrected me are women. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> All right. So, but 14th. Yeah. Uh, uh, people remember 14th for, I mean, with mixed feelings. Uh, if your heart has been broken before, uh, 14th may not be a day to look forward to, but if you are in a very thriving love relationship right now, you have expectations, especially if there's been a tradition in your marriage. It's not in every marriage or in every, every relationship that it's a tradition, but in some, it's been a tradition. So you expect that one of the days, I mean, that's not the only day we should express love to each other, but it's one of the days we celebrate and mark love. So this month, we are discussing the rudiments of the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, and how this love should pervade and permeate our lives and, you know, uh, reconfigure how we live our lives. So we, we've titled the series, Love Struck. And we pray today that the love of God will strike at the heart of all of us this season. I cannot hear your amen. amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. My, my wife preached the first service and... Um, after the message, my share value went up. My share price, personally, went up. Because she said something that made people come to meet me to say, ah, PG, we didn't know that you are, you are that good of a lover. Yes. So I'm going to retaliate. <laughs> Just in case, I mean, I mean you, can, you can get the message, a message, you understand what I'm saying. But I'm not going to go into it. Because if I go over it, it will be like blowing my trumpet. And I don't want to be proud. <laughs> so, so, but I'm going to retaliate. Now, she told a story about how love can motivate you to action, especially when you can perceive love in the one that claimed to love you. She, you know, she, she told a story about something that I did just after we announced our engagement, even just before we got married. But I'm going to tell another story of something that she also did just... You know, singing people are very emotional people. Yeah. So choir, they're always very, yeah, very soft, softy, softy, somebody, so, some people there. Praise God. So this was what happened. Um, I think this happened, I think, in year 2001 or so. Yeah, so that's 19 years ago now. Um, I, I had a car that was given to me by my older brother to use. Uh, it was a Volvo 240 GL. The one that when you rev it, four, four liters of oil has gone. <laughs> and my, my, as, as you know, at the time, I was just managing my salary. So that car was, was not helping. Yeah. So by the time I drove it to work and back, I had to refuel. If you have driven a Volvo before, you understand what I'm saying. Especially the old one. So I was just trusting God for another car. So one day, I went to visit a friend somewhere in the Kedja, around Twain Street. And I saw this Honda car, I think it was in the 1989 model Honda car that was parked. You know, nice silver color. I went to check it. The one they call, I think in Nigeria, we call it pure water or something like that. Yeah. It, that's how seemingly useless people put it. Yeah. But as at the time, it was a great car and good for my level. Yeah. And because we respect ourselves. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I went. I can still remember the price of the car was 220,000 naira. As at which time I'd saved up 120,000 naira. So I went, priced the car, spoke to the owner. He was a neighbor to a friend that I was visiting, a good friend of mine on Twain Street. And uh, the man, you know, told me, if you want it, I mean, I have one or two people showing interest, if you can just. So I left there, long story short, just trusting God. How can I raise 100,000 naira so I can add to the 120 that I had and buy this car? So I can be relieved of this poor guzzler 
that I was that was driving me. I wasn't driving that car. The car was driving me. Yeah. <laughs> so um, then we were we were dating. Oh, I'm not even sure we started dating. We were friends. Yeah, we were friends. And later in the evening, Daddy, I was just you know telling her about how I saw a car. And I wanted to drop this other car, and I, I needed to buy this car, you know, and, all, and we we're just talking. And at the end of the day, she said, you know what, um, I'm going to help your fate, as in I'm going to, uh, 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 and she, get, she, 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 she wrote a check for 50,000 naira. Yeah. Now, I, I need you to be mindful of this. We weren't married, and we were not engaged. We were just... We were just, you know, we were just liking each other. Or maybe I was liking her more. But when I got the check, I told myself, I'm marrying this lady. <laughs> Not, nothing in this world. Nothing. You know, like when the Bible says, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Yeah, love of God in Christ Jesus. I said, nothing. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> so, a lot of us have different love languages. But there's nothing like somebody speaking your love language and speaking it in a grand style. It gets your attention, it puts you on a frequency where you are willing to be moved to action to do something to, you know, recompense that love that has been shown. So, when we think about that, and we think about the love gesture that God, you know, made towards us, how should he move us? Because I remember after that time, in fact, all that story that she told in first service, she didn't know that what motivated some of the things I was doing after that time was the fact that, I mean, I was just telling myself, what kind of a strange human being is this? How can you have no commitment to a lady and she's willing? I mean, as at the time, she, she, uh, she was in a second job, which she worked in a bank. Uh, she had worked in that bank just for barely a year, about a year or so. You know, I think she joined the bank in 2000 or so. Yeah. Uh, and she, she didn't even have a car of her own at that time. Yeah. So, you know, the kind of love that really motivates you to want to take action, to want to do something extra, to want to go the extra mile for someone else, that's the kind of love that God demonstrated towards us. When he gave his all, you know, we said the proof of love is giving and forgiving. God did both. He gave his first begotten in the person of Christ, then he forgave us our sins. There's no better demonstration of love than to demonstrate it in giving and forgiving. And that's what God did. What should his gesture elicit from us? That's, that's a big question. Because a lot of us talk about the fact that God loves us. But we shy away from talking about how do we respond to this love? What should this love gesture mean to us? And what kind of action should it uh, elicit from us? What should we be motivated to do knowing that we are loved like this? The Bible says there's no greater love than this than a man who lay down his life for his friend. Now, if I enjoy that kind of love, what action, what behavior should it elicit from me? And a lot of us here, just like I told my own story, just like my wife told a story earlier this morning, you have been shown love before. In little ways and in big ways. You know, in little ways and in big ways. And you know how you responded to that law. That's what we're discussing this new series. And I'm starting now with this message I've titled, The Family That Cares. The Family That Cares. 
And there's a letter in the Bible written by the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 4. We're going to read together as a church, assuming that this letter was written to us as a church. So I call this the, a, a letter to, go, go back, a letter to the Elevation Church. Yeah, a letter to the Elevation Church. And you know, in, in, in the Bible days, when uh, all the letters of Paul that were written, Ephesians, Corinthians, the, the, the First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, all those letters that were written, they were written not to individuals, but to churches. So this is the picture. When Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthian church, the letters were delivered. Yeah. Sometimes we would say, written by my hand, some other times it dictated and somebody else wrote. When the letter got to the city, the church was called to order and called to an assembly. And then someone, either the person who brought the letter, just to show that they're reading the right thing, because not everybody could read, we read the letter. You know, if you brought a letter to this church now, and the pastor is reading it, whatever the apostle wrote that is not in favor of the pastor, if the apostle rebuked the pastor, the pastor will not read that part. I hope you understand what I'm saying, yeah. So what they did was to make sure that these letters were read openly, not by the leaders of the church, because it was written to them, but by whoever brought it, or somebody who could read that accompanied who brought it, and they would read it openly. So, Let's follow the same format this morning. It will be displayed on the screen. First John 4 from verse 7 to 20. It's a bit of a long reading, but to lay a very good foundation for this discussion all through this month, we are going to read it together as a church. Can we go one, two, go? Their elevation. Let us continue to love one another. For love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God. For God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins their elevation. Since God loved us, we surely ought to love one another. It's ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them and they live in God. We know how much God loves us and we put our trust in his love. God is love and all who live in love live in God. God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid in the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Christ. Yes. So, if we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment and this it shows that we have not fully experienced this perfect love. We love each other because he loved us first. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow church member, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he who has given us his command, don't love God must also love their fellow believers. Can we read that last verse one, two, go again? That Praise God. That those who love God must also love their fellow believers. The Lord bless the reading of his word. So this is like a letter written to all of us. As members of this household, individually and collectively, and also as members 
of whatever household God has placed us in outside of the church family or the faith-based community. In the different communities that we belong to, in our families, this is how God expects us to understand his love and live in the respect of that. Now, as I go into my three main points for the day, uh, I need you to put this on the backdrop of the fact that when we teach about the love of God, which is primarily expressed through uh, people to us, we must come to terms with the fact that all, I mean, a lot of us will be at different levels from each other. Uh, some people have gone through traumatic experiences in life. Uh, those experiences have um, limited their capacity to receive love. Some other people have gone through other kind of experiences that have also limited their capacity to give love, especially when trust has been broken. So, whatever kind of trauma somebody listening to me today may have suffered before, and believe me, when it comes to um, trauma, especially physical, I've experienced one or two situations that... Um, have given me the understanding of what it feels like to suffer a, uh, any kind of trauma that can limit you. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, about a year ago or so, yeah, about a year ago, I got this um, thing they call Segway. What's the other name for it? Uh, Uberboard, yeah, for my kids. They, they actually uh, bullied me into buying it. Because uh, when it comes to certain um, risky things, I'm not very good at them. Yeah, and um, a little careful. You know, so it, it, was, it was a lot of pushing and shoving before I decided that, uh, okay, I was going to... In fact, I asked them what they wanted for their birthday and Christmas. And the two of them said, overboard. Just buy us one is enough. If you buy us one, it's birthday, Christmas, everything put together. I said, okay. Uh, I, give, I gave up and, I, and then I bought it. So they, they, for young people, some of those things, it's easier for them to get used to it. You know, so they've seen it with their friends, they've seen it on YouTube and all that. I just brought it, they coupled it together, charged it, and boom, the press the thing, stayed on it, and the thing was taking them all over the place. So after a few weeks, I was fascinated just looking at them. <laughs> you know, using this thing around the house, you send somebody to the kitchen to go and bring something, and they get on their overboard, and then go and bring you water, and, you know. I was like, okay. So, so th this day, nobody was there. Nobody was really looking. I said, let me just try out this thing. Yeah. So, I stayed on it. Uh, there's something that you press, and then you use your leg to do the rest. Uh, long story short, the thing moved me, moved me. And after a while, I lost my balance. And the thing just took me like that. My leg entered under the chair. And uh, this, my instep here, was locked under a chair. Uh, because practically, I fell. <laughs> Not under the anointing. I fell. The overboard movement, you know. So, this is where I was going. Eventually, my leg was rescued from under the chair, but that instep, the, this place was a bit traumatized. So, I, I had to walk gently for a while. You know, when you just walk gently. Um, I can't remember whether I took an x or not, but uh, I, I nursed it back to life, gradually. So, I remember the May of that year, I was doing my, my annual medical, and my doctor was asking me, so do you have any complaints, any pain in any part of your body? I said, yeah, I, I feel some pain in my, my, my knee area. And she said, have you ever felt anything like that before? I said, no. So she asked me questions. So she then asked me, did you suffer any kind of trauma in the last six months, you know? And then all of a sudden, I remember that experience. And I said, what do you mean by trauma? She said, like, maybe you fell or you had any kind of injury, you know. And I said, yeah, I, I fell, uh, you know, overboard, you know, and all that. <laughs> and then she said, okay, how do you feel in the exact place? 
I said, well, not, no more pain there. She said, it's possible that the pain from there was, was, had moved up to this place. Yeah. And it's now affecting this place now. So, um, what you just, she just told me, don't worry, it will go. Since you're a pastor, you're praying, right? I said, yes. <laughs> and she, you know, she said it will go. So, that made me more conscious because I didn't know where that knee pain was coming from before. So, I was laying my hands on it and praying and then exercising better and exercising the leg. Uh, to the glory of God, I don't feel anything there right now. Both my knee and the place where I was traumatized is all gone. But it took a process of one year. Yeah. For me not to feel anything here again and for this one also to disappear. Now, this is what, what, what I'm talking about. Some traumatic experiences even move from one state to the other in our lives or move from one area to another. Yeah. Because this is physical trauma. There's also emotional trauma. When we go through emotional trauma in our dealings with one another, we mm -hmm. underestimate the effect that it creates in how we're able to comprehend the love of God which is supposed to be shown to man. And our capacity to receive and to give it will be greatly affected by some of the things that we have gone through. You know, when it comes to physical ailments, and maybe, I don't know, maybe in September when we go into better half series, I'll be able to teach a lot more about this. But let me just explain what I'm trying to say. When it comes to physical ailments, as humans, we are very quick to treat things because they give us physical hindrances. Maybe you're not able to walk properly. You can imagine if I was dragging my foot to the pulpit this morning, you, all of you would know. After I said, some people come and meet me, Pastor, did you play football? Pastor, what happened to you? But you know, people drag different parts of themselves emotionally, and we're not even aware. Yeah. A loving person can become a very cantankerous person, a hateful person, just because of something they have gone through. And instead of people really feeling for them and asking, why does this person behave like this? Why is this kind of, you know, little bit of abnormality in this person's capacity to understand I'm trying to love her or I'm trying to be nice? You know, some people can't even take simple, you know, nicety, as in just being nice, small, towards them, they, they take off. Because the person that was nice two years ago almost took their life. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. The people here, I mean, this may not be your first church. I don't know what you went through in your first church or second church or your parents' church or whatever, you got into, got into a church family like this, you are literally suspecting everybody. Yeah, because of a trauma that has moved from one area to the other or that has stayed for so long and because emotional things are not easily understood like physical things. You know, if I have a headache physically, it's easy for me to know I have a headache. Something is banging here. A lot of the time we have emotional aches that we cannot even define. We don't even know what to call it. We just know that we're changing. And that we're repelling people. And that we're not able to demonstrate the love of God towards people. I pray this morning that if there's anyone who had the influence of this service, anyone watching online, from any of our expressions, I declare today that the healing hand of God comes upon your life. That this season will bring healing over your life Amen. in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, having said that, we're discussing this all through the month, but having said that, I want to just quickly layer in the remaining time that I have three basic things that you should understand. And I'm going to go them very quickly. One is that love is our nature. So we don't have any excuse for not being able to live a life of love. It's our nature. It's natural to us, to a child of God, to love. The Bible says God is love. And he that is born of God is born of love. And I cannot claim that God is in me if it will show in my outward disposition of loving people. It has to show. It's not the size of my Bible or how loud my tongue is when it comes to praying in tongue in prayer or how, how, how long I can fast. I mean, we just finished a 21-day fast. And I know there may be people who have continued. And that's great, because it's a spiritual exercise, and the Bible says we should exercise ourselves to godliness. But what shows that God is in me, primarily speaking, is the nature of God, which is love, that I demonstrate. 
Not all the spiritual disciplines and all the outward spiritual expressions, but the nature of God. You, I can't say I'm a human being and I back all the time. Yeah, very soon people will doubt whether I'm really a human being or something went wrong along the line. So rather than talking the way I'm talking right now, I'm just backing back all the time. I mean, you wake up in the morning, neighbor is hearing backing and they know you don't have a dog. I, I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. Yeah, they start to doubt whether we have a real human being neighbor. Because the nature of a human being is to talk, to be articulate, to sing, to talk, to make sound that have meaning. But what happens is that when something has gone wrong, it affects our nature. It affects our nature. Romans 5 and verse 5, the Bible says, the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit who was given to us by God. So if the Spirit of God is in me, when I gave my life to Christ, my spirit man was renewed or rebathed after the order of Christ. And the Bible says, then God made a deposit of his spirit in me. So I have a connection with God. as a seed of God in me by the Spirit of God. The outward expression of that seed is, part of it is love, because that's the nature. You know Galatians 5 and 22, the Bible says this, the, the fruit of the Spirit are ah, love, joy, peace. Love was the first one. Look at it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Can you put that on the screen for me? Galatians 5 and 22. The, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love. When you talk about fruit, that means there's a seed. Before there can be a fruit, there's also already a seed. Are we together? I said, are we together? Yeah? Before there can be a fruit, there's a seed. That means there's a fruit, I mean, there's a seed that God has deposited in me. And it says, when that seed is in my own spirit man that is now renewed after Christ, it brings forth fruit. And the fruit that it brings forth, the first one among them is love, joy, peace, and all that. But the first one is love. Now, we all bear fruit in different measures, and fruits don't come out right. And I said that one more time. I said, fruits don't come out right immediately. But how I know that a tree, Jesus said, a tree is recognized by the fruits that it bears. And if I am trying to bring forth fruit, and it's not ripening quickly, something is wrong. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. After a while, the fruit should ripe and be consumable. Some people have given excuses for too long. Jesus is a healer. Even if you have been traumatized, it should not hinder your capacity to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. All you need to trust God for is a healing. Jesus, in Mark 11, the popular Mark 11, the faith, uh, Mark 11, Mark 11, 23, 24, if you shall say unto this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and you shall not doubt in your heart. But before Jesus got there, it was because the disciples asked him, Master, this fig tree that you caused yesterday has dried up. How, come, I mean, how can we do this? And he said, if you have faith like this, you can speak and it will happen. But if we backtrack to the beginning of Mark 11, what you see there was that Jesus looked at a fig tree, he wanted fruit from it, and he could not get fruit from it. When God looks out from heaven today, he wants the fruit of love in my life and in your life. And we don't want to be like the fig tree that is not demonstrating the full nature, the full nature of the tree. The nature of a fig tree is to bring forth fruit, not just to have leaves. There are too many believers today with leaves. Leaves of Christianity, but no fruit of Christianity, no fruit of righteousness, which primarily is love. Every other thing is layered on love. Are you still with me today? Yeah? So it's not how religious I look. It's not how religious I look. It's not how many of verses of the scripture I know. The first evidence that God is in me is that I bear the fruit of love. So every family has its language, Culture and tradition and love is the language and culture of the church and of the kingdom of God. And also you need to understand that love is not a suggestion, neither is it discretionary. It's a commandment. It's a commandment. It's a commandment. Love is a commandment. Love is a commandment. John 13, when you read 34 and 35 of John 13, it says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. 
Love each other. It's a new command. It's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. It's not uh, something that you just do if you, if, you, if you like it, you know, and all that. No. It's, it's, it's a commandment. I said, okay, yeah. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Look at your neighbor for me. Say, I'm supposed to love you. Oh, and smile as you say that. Yeah. Because you can't tell somebody, I'm supposed to love you. <laughs> Praise God. Secondly, you know I said three things. Secondly, love is best expressed and groomed in family. Love is best expressed and groomed in family. So the church, being the family of God, is the best place to, to experience, uh, understand, and grow in love. That's the best place for it. Because love is to be expressed and groomed in family. So love is groomed, tested, and exercised in family. You know, while growing up, you have your fair share of your fight with your siblings if you're not an only child. By the time you become a teenager, you also have a fair share with your, your parents trying to constrain you, trying to, you know, because, uh, you know, I have two teenagers now and almost every day there's something that we're contending with each other about. Because now they know how to marshal their point. You know, and I used to think to myself, you, there was a time you couldn't talk. Yeah. And I told you everything and you did it. Now, everything I say must be questioned. But dad, why? Why? Why, why must we do that? I mean, we're coming to church today, and uh, I said, come for first service. You have assessment this week, so you can go back home and read. But dad, why? You can come anytime. You can come for second service. You can come. I said, but I'm thinking for you. You don't have to. You know, it's like, you don't have to think for us. Let's just come when we have to come. I said, come early so you can go back home and read. You have test tomorrow. No. So, and I'm wondering, I've, I've been there before. <laughs> I'm trying to help you. And you're still arguing with me. They just, they just enjoy argument. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they even, after the argument, they tell you that they're just having fun on you. Yeah. But, you know, all that is to work in love. Because if you're not working in love, I mean, you can, you can conk somebody's head. <laughs> yeah. Because you just wonder, you, I'm paying your school fees, I put it under my house, I feed you. You are still arguing with me, come here, come here, come here. Yeah. Well, eh, so I'm just saying that within family, we are constrained to work in love. Sometimes, the person you are supposed to love the most is the one you are struggling to love the most. Yeah, I'm talking to people who are married here this morning. Sometimes it's easy for you to love your colleague at work and sacrifice for them. And you are struggling with loving your spouse and sacrificing for them. Just because we have not been able to get through a particular trauma or something that, that has hindered your capacity to receive love from them or give love to them. And I pray this morning, again, that the healing power of God will flow through this congregation this season. In the name of the Lord Jesus. That our homes will become places of love. That our families will become a place of love. And this church will become a loving, really loving, love-saturated church in the name of Jesus. Secondly, uh, uh, talking about love being groomed in family, the responsibility of a caring church is collective. It's collective. The responsibility of a caring family is collective. In a church like this, some people just feel, you know, it's the responsibility of the pastors, or I'm in a unit, it's the responsibility of my unit leader to make sure that we're all loving and show us love. No, love is collective. Responsibility is collective. You are the church, just as I'm the church. How can we have a loving church if you are not loving? Because church is not a building, church is people. Yeah. Family is not one person. One person cannot be a family. The reason why we say family is that there's mother, father, and children. Or just mother, father. We already have a family. The, the smallest unit of a family is two people. Am I saying the truth? The responsibility to make love thrive in that family rests on the two. The same way in the family of God, the responsibility to make a church, a loving church, is a collective responsibility. Glory be to Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 14, the Bible says the love of God constrains us. It constrains us to behave in certain ways, to show love in certain ways. Glory be to Jesus. A caring church is made up of caring people. You are the church. Yeah. 
caring church is made up of caring people. It's made up of caring people. Made up of caring people. Can you look at your neighbor for me and say, this is a caring church? Because you are here. And you are a caring person. Glory be to Jesus. A caring church is made up of caring people. And you and I are the church. And also, before I take my last and final point, uh, let me just add this one to this second point. Love values people more than things. Yeah. If you haven't gotten anything from all that I've said so far, please add that to it. Love values people more than things. You can be in a church like this. You can be in a work environment. You can be in family. And you're so focused on material things, on what to gain, what is the need for me, to the detriment of people, people, people. And it messes up everything. We live in a world that is very materialistic. You know, material driven, profit driven, driven. And sometimes you can be so profit oriented, can be so materialistic to the detriment of walking in the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Our nation is the way it is today because of lack of love for that other human beings. How will somebody steal money that's supposed to be used to fix a road that millions of people will travel on? People die on that road every day, and the person is here enjoying the money. That's, that's the work of the devil. That per, I don't care who the person is. If the person still goes to a church and still behaves like a Christian, the person is not a Christian. The love of God is not in that person's heart. It's the, it's, it's the, the, the action is demonic. Glory be to Jesus. Because we, we need to, to tell ourselves the own truth. In nations where they don't know God, but that the ethics of nation building, which is based on Judeo Christian principles, have been the foundation of, of, of that nation, you see people being cultures, loving each other, and they're not even Christians. But when you, when you go into Western Europe, that's what you see. When you go into America, that's what you see. All the people who went to North America to start those places, they were people with Christian foundation who led where they are to that place. And they built the community based on certain Judeo-Christian principles of trust, you know, of love for one another. And that's what you see. The credit system abroad is based on just trust. Now, people will come from Africa and go there and call them mumu for trusting each other to be able to extend credit to one another. And then you carry credit card, swipe it, swipe it, swipe it, take everything, bring it back to Africa and say, yeah, we show them. What are you showing? Yeah. If, if unbelievers are doing that, we even understand. Some people will still come to church and that's how they live. There's no love of God in your heart. There's no love of God in your heart. Because you can't hurt somebody to make progress and think that you are living in God. The Bible says, whoever lives in God must show the nature of God, which is love. Glory be to Jesus. Lastly today, love is the most powerful force there is. The most powerful force. The most powerful force there is. 1 Corinthians 12 and 31 says, I show you the more excellent way. And when, it, when, when you go to 13 and 1, you start to talk about love. If I have a tongue of angel, and I don't have love, you know, I'm like a, you know, a simba that is just making noise and all that. Love gives life to any effort, achievement, or conquest. Without love, everything fades into meaninglessness. Without love, all the money that you have, all the money that I have, all the material things that you may possess, they are meaningless. They are meaningless. All conquests, all medals are meaningless if they're based on the premise of lack of love. That's what we're saying. The greatest expression of, of God in the Bible, the, I mean, what we call the power of God, the power of God can be limited by inability to express love. When you read all through the scriptures, you see that the power of God flows through Jesus based on the premise of love. He checked the feeding of 5,000. The Bible says we were moved by compassion. He looked at them. Love welled up in his spirit. We've kept these people here for so long. They need to hit something. That love compelled God's power to flow to multiply bread and fish. Some people want to do miracles today. 
but the motive is not love. Yeah, you are an herbalist. Yeah, if you do that. That's simple. Simply put. They're just simply an herbalist. Yeah. I don't care how big the pastor is. Anyone that uses the power of God without the understanding that the premise for the flow of God's power is first of all love for humanity. Yeah. Christ did not come to die to make a show. You can die and rise up again. Yeah. Just so, so that you people would know that death cannot bind, bind me. I just, you know. That's what some people think, that that's how, what, what Christ came to do. No, he didn't come to do that. The motive for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. Last day today, uh, that John 3 system, that popular verse, New Living Translation. When you look at New Living Translation, can you put it up for me quickly? Wrap up on that. New Living Translation, John 3 16. Quickly, quickly. It says, uh, uh, how God... So this, for this is how God loved the world. This is how God loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. How are you loving? Because this is how God loved. He loved how he gave. The question is, how are you loving? How are you loving? Because if only we will love one another, bridges will be built, Relationship will be mended. If only we will love one another, healing will come. Healing from abuse, from slavery, from murder. If only we will love one another, we will see an, a, a demonstration of God's presence like never before. So elevation, let us love one another. We must go beyond the love that says we must leave the kind of love that acts. Not just the love that says or talk, but the kind of love that acts. So, this week, this week, this week, this is my recommendation this week as we go into this week, to so start out this month of love, this week, this is my recommendation this week. Forgive anyone who may have, may have hurt you and make a physical attempt to reconcile. Yeah, make a physical attempt to reconcile. This is our to-do list this week. And I beg of you to please, if any of this apply to you, do something about them this week. That's the only way to prove that you're coming to church today is not just to mark attendance, but to, to start to do something differently. That learning is going on, but not just that learning is going on, you're allowing the Spirit of God who indwells us. The Bible says the one that's at work within us to will and to do of God's pleasure. So, what to do this week? What should the Holy Spirit enable me to do this week to forgive anyone who may have hurt me and make physical attempt to reconcile? Secondly, forgive anyone in this church, within this church family, who may have hurt you. Do this this week. And let them know that you are forgiving them. And then engage in conscious, not random, conscious act of kindness. Conscious act of kindness. Somebody around you who doesn't have a job, you know you can make the leads for them. Do it this week. Be conscious about it. Somebody who needs help with something, just go ahead this week and do something about it. Talk to them about, I need to do this, I need to do this. Conscious, not just random. You know, we have done random before, where we say pay somebody's uh, toll fee at the toll gate, do it to people you don't know. This time, we're talking about people you know. Before we go random, let us do conscious. Yeah, conscious is people around us. Let's show some love this week. Bow down your heads, please, everyone. Glory be to Jesus. I said, glory be to Jesus. Lift your two hands to Jesus and just ask him, Lord Jesus, I release my heart to you today. Fill my heart with your spirit. I want to be a love being. I want to love people. I want your nature to show freely through me. If anything has hindered your capacity to grow the fruit of love, will you pray today? Like the farmer will pour manure around the plant to, for it to be able to grow properly. Will you say, Holy Spirit, pour out yourself upon my heart today like a manure that comes upon a, 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 a plant that makes it to bring forth. I want to bring forth this year the fruit of love, the fruit of kindness, the fruit of patience. I want to bring forth this year. I want to be a loving soul this year. I want to be known at my workplace as, as, as someone who, who, who has the love of God in his or her heart. That's what I want. I want to be a better boss this year. 
I want to be a better supporting staff. I want to be a better employee this year. I want to be a better business owner this year. I want to be a better spouse this year. I want to be a better spouse this year. I want to be a better neighbor this year. Not the cantankerous one. I want to be able to forgive freely. I want to be able to show the love of God in my community. I want to be able to show the love of God in my church. Let that be the prayer of your heart today. Let that be the prayer of your heart today. And last day today, I want you to pray. This time around, if you want to verbalize it, verbalize it. And just say, Lord, um, I'm letting go of this animosity. I'm letting go of this bitterness. I'm letting go of this person that has really hurt me. I'm letting go. I want to let go of this trauma. I need your healing. I know I can't do it on my own. I need your healing. Is there any emotionally traumatic experience that you can remember? Will you put it in the hand of God right now and say, Lord, heal my heart. Heal my heart. You can do it. You have power to do it. And I'm submitting my heart to you today. Lord, heal my heart. Heal my heart of this trauma, this emotional trauma. Heal my heart. Heal my heart. Heal my heart. Somebody speak to God today. Lord, heal my heart. I know I can't do it alone. I can't do it by my own power. I've tried, but it's not working. I'm submitting it to you today. That you heal my heart. Heal my heart. Thank you, Jesus. Lift your two hands with me, everyone. Father, in the name of Jesus. We submit ourselves to you today. Love is your nature. And we recognize it as we have seen it in your word today. As a church, as the Elevation Church, right from here to all of our expressions, we ask everlasting Father that you pour out your, 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 your spirit upon us afresh. Your word says you are the, 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 the one that pour out your love in our heart by your spirit. Do it again and again this season. As the whole world will be celebrating lost rather than love. Help us to focus on love. Help us to focus on agape love. Help us to focus on demonstrating your nature in everything that we do this month and this year. Let the motive be love. Let your power flow through us. Let it cause healing to happen. Let it cause reconciliations to happen. Let your grace flow over everything that we do. And let your name be glorified in the precious name of Jesus. So I rebuke any endurance this morning to the free flow of love, to give and to receive over the life of anyone under the influence of my voice. And I decree today that you are healed. The healing power of God comes upon your heart, takes the pain away. You will forget the pain of the past and the love of God will motivate you this season to let go, to reconcile and to do something differently in the name of Jesus. Thank you everlasting Father. In the precious name of Jesus. See with all else bowed. I'd love to pray for anyone in this service this morning. Please, just for the privacy of the moment, you can bow down your heads. I will appreciate it. I'd love to pray for anyone in this service this morning who may be saying, Pastor, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior. I want to give my life to Jesus. Or somebody else may be saying, Pastor, I gave my life to Christ before, but I backslid into sin. Right now, I cannot say that the love of Christ is still in my heart. If Jesus should come today, Pastor, uh, I'm, a, I'm a honest person. I don't want to lie. I can't go with him. And I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. Or I want to give my life to Jesus and have a brand new relationship with him from this moment forward. This is the first Sunday of the month of February. The year is moving so fast. And God wants to do something new in your life this year. And this, the earlier you allow him and give him the right of way fully, the better. So that he can perfect what he has started in your life. If there's anyone here this morning you want to say, Jesus, come into my life. I really want to uh, release my heart to you. Somebody saying, I want to rededicate my life to you. I know I stepped out of line completely and I've broken fellowship with you. Will you lift your right hand with me wherever you may be sitting? Will you lift your right hand with me? I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to pray for you. If you want to say any of these prayers with me, just lift your right hand above your head. And I'd love to pray for you right now. On the gallery down here, thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands there. Please just lift your right hand a bit above your head. Let me know that you're saying a prayer with me. If your hand is up, I want you to remain where you are, but stand. Stand with me so we can pray together. Just stand where you are. Stand where you are. Thank you for standing. Just stand where you are. Stand with me. Stand with me where you are. So we can say this prayer together. Thank you for standing. Thank you for standing. Right on the gallery, on the main floor. Thank you for standing. Thank you for standing. Thank you for standing. God who began this good work in you he will perfect it in the name of Jesus. I'm still waiting for one person. One person who is second guessing this decision. Uh, uh, it's just a, a one minute prayer and your life will never be the same again. If God is prompting your heart, please stand right now. I don't care about who is here or who is not here. Life is a personal adventure. 
Life is a personal adventure. Thank you for standing. Thank you for standing, my brother. Thank you for standing. If you're standing, can you say after me? Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I cannot save myself. So I open up my heart to you. I ask that you forgive me my sins and that you cleanse me from every unrighteousness. I accept you today as my Lord and my personal savior. Fill my heart with your spirit and start something new in my life. I willingly, completely surrender my life to you. Thank you, Father, for accepting me. If you just say those, say those words with me, I want you to walk to the house that is closest to you. Everyone standing, just walk to the house that is closest to you. We have counselors at the house. We just want to spend like five minutes of your time with you and you'll be back with us in the service. They will also take your details and introduce you to our faith development classes that we'll put together as a responsible church to help everyone who is new in the faith to, to grow and to mature in their faith in Christ. So I want you to please listen to them and uh, we will be willing to help in any way uh, possible. Can we appreciate everyone who made a decision today? Everyone who made a decision, can we appreciate them? Thank you very much.